What up world, my name is Chris. I'm one of the three original founders of the BSDN store here in Munich, Germany. And I'm also in charge of our product line collaborations. Why the hell am I telling you this? Because I'm here today to talk about this bad boy, the 84 Forum High Yugo Plastica edition that we recently launched with our good friends at Adidas. The concept behind the shoe was to show our love and appreciation for heritage European basketball culture, specifically for the 89 to 91 Yugo Plastica team, a team that won the three-peat and can definitely be considered an absolute European powerhouse. My colleague Chris and I recently had the big honor to sit down for a Zoom interview with two absolute legends that played on this Yugo Plastica team. But not only did they play on this Yugo Plastica team, they also both went on to have esteemed NBA careers. I'm talking about Hall of Famer and former Boston Celtic, Dino Raja, and the legend himself, the spider from Split, Mr. Tony Kukoc, who played for the Chicago Bulls. The conversation shows just how passionate Tony and Dino are about their former days at Yugo Plastica, but they also give great insight on what it meant to be a young European basketball player in the early 90s in the NBA. On that note, we really hope you enjoy the interview as much as we did, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. So, Tony Dino, great to have you guys on the call. Um, just a brief introduction of how this call actually came about. Um, we recently got approached by the good people at Adidas uh, to do something special around their forum basketball shoe model, which is obviously one of the iconic uh, basketball models um, of the 80s, uh, Dino, you have it sitting there in the background. Um, and us being a European cultured, uh, culturally and, and, and situated um, company uh, with deep roots in basketball culture, we wanted to do something really special and we wanted to pay respect to, in our opinion, one of the greatest powerhouses and dynasty uh, dynasties to ever bless uh, the hard courts of the European basketball leagues which in our opinion definitely is the 89 uh, to 91 uh, Yugo Plastica team. So to have you guys both here that both played on this team uh, and to get some firsthand insights on, on uh, how that era actually went down is obviously amazing. So thank you much, very much for joining us today. Thank you guys for having us. So the reactions to these shoes, especially on the Balkans, were off the chain. There was so much feedback, all of it positive. Maybe you guys can tell us what your first impression was when you first saw the shoes and maybe also tell us what the Yugo Plastica team still means for the region today. Who's going to go first? You go first. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, when I, I have to be honest, when I saw it first, I thought somebody uh, did a Photoshop. <laughs> uh, then when, when things start developing, I, I realized that, um, what a great honor um, we have by a huge company as Adidas uh, giving us uh, respect they are. And um, like next day I got overwhelmed in my Instagram and Facebook accounts uh, with people, when, when, when can I get it? Where can I get it? What is this? Uh, how can I get it? How much are they? Uh, I got like a million messages people asking when where how much uh, it's unbelievable number of uh, contacts i have lately uh, people asking different kind of questions no no i i agree at first i thought that that was a joke somebody put like a a, a car chain or key chain that that with the, with the shoe just just for fun and uh was kind of teasing us about the, the, the old days and, and to, to, to start being nostalgic about stuff. But when I heard that it was true, that actually uh, uh, the, the, the whole project came alive, I agree with Dino. It's, it's a great honor that, that somebody after all these years is giving us this much, um, that much credit for, uh, for, for basketball we played uh, at the time and honoring us with a, with a shoe these days. Uh, although I have to tell you my story with that shoe, I, I think that some people are going to laugh, some people are going to think it's, uh, it's important. But uh, when we started playing basketball, the shoe was really hard to get. And uh, I had to actually wait for my coach to, to, to kind of give me his pair of shoes. He wore those shoes almost like two years. And once he felt that he cannot wear them anymore, that they all worn out, he actually gave it to me. And I had to put some cardboard inside so the shoe doesn't 
run out of the the uh, the, 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 the the bottom. But to me, it was the most favorite shoe I ever had. It, it, it is the greatest. Uh, I would, besides sleeping in that shoe, I would practice. I would go to school. I would go the in town. That, that was like the, the the greatest pair of shoes I, I I ever got, and and I always have that in my memory. Uh, the the top ten, uh, the the blue, red, blue. Uh, it was just it, it was it was just something I'll I'll never forget. Amazing. Awesome. So I think we just learned something really interesting for all parents with with uh, kids that they want to hopefully send to the NBA. Uh, let them wear their coach's shoes and put some cardboard inside. Uh, it's your highest chance of, of uh, uh, winning an NBA championship at that point. Oh, I, <laughs> I don't think that's the – sorry. Go ahead. I never got the new shoes until I – I don't remember. I was already, like, uh, playing for the A team. Uh, yeah, I think a national team. The first time we got a we, – we actually got the first pairs with a national team that we would bring – To the, to the team to play with. Yeah. My first shoes, I remember they gave me uh, the, the worn shoes of, of Jerko. It's a guy who played for, the, for, the, for our team. He's, uh, he was a national team player who is about 10, 15 years older than me. And they gave me his old shoes. And I remember coming to practice, watching at the shoes for the first five minutes of the practice. And, and, and it was unbelievable, uh, you know, honor to, to get them. I was the lucky guy to get the, the, the one-year-old old, uh, worn shoes. Was it at least in your guys' sizes? So your coach had the same yeah, size? Yeah, it was my size, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. That was, uh, that, that, that was okay. That, that was really... So, so this, this uh, the, the gentleman, uh, Zoran Grasha, who we know, who we know well, and he was actually our coach at one point. And I, when we were juniors, he always laughed. And then he tells me, if it wasn't for my shoes, you would never become a basketball player. <laughs> <laughs> um, guys, my next question would be the, the, the 89 to 91 Yugoplastica team is definitely, as I earlier also said, at the definition of a European dynasty powerhouse. Um, How did these years impact your guys' career going forward? Also speaking of scouts back in the days, etc. You go first now. I'll go. <laughs> okay. Well, obviously, it was, uh, it, it was a great time for us. Um, we had an awesome basketball team. Uh, everybody really played for each other. Uh, we, we understood the meaning of team. We, we had uh, really good coaches, awesome coaches uh, that, that just put that uh, uh, a hard work mentality, defense mentality, total basketball game into us. And uh, uh, practicing like that every day um, actually just just showed when we played the games. And, and it, it carried us uh, these, these couple years, these, these, let's say, three years uh, to win. Uh, first national championships and then uh, three European championships in a row. And, um, well, at that time, the, the, the NBA scouts the, the started to, to come and, and look the European uh, finals and uh, obviously uh, uh, European championships with the national teams, uh, Olympics and world championships. And I guess that was one of the main reasons how, how our names got to the NBA. You know, want to add? You know, uh, when everything happens in, in, in eight, since, you know, 87, 88, 89, 90, uh, I, I don't think we realized uh, really how, how big that team was. Uh, now watching from a safe distance, I can tell you exactly, like, we're like Beatles. <laughs> uh, wherever we go, people were... Um, Waiting us with uh, with you know applause and they they boo us a little bit but not too much you know people like us because we play nice basketball we play real basketball game you know it was a um, bunch of talented guys uh, with some you know uh, hard working guys and uh, that combination was uh, was really nice to watch and. Um, We had like uh, me and Tony, who are like uh, two meter ten, both of us uh, running like uh, 
like you know guards and that was unusual for that uh, era uh, today that that's normal back then in in, in the late 80s uh, it was um, something new and um, wherever we go people were were you know liking us and um, it was an unbelievable feeling you know um, to be part of that uh, team and uh, we had so much fun so much fun playing and then being friends and uh, being friends even today with uh, with all of those guys and um, I'm really you know proud to be part of that uh, that that team now, I just want to I just want to add that at that time as as many of the good teams were in in ex Yugoslavia talking about uh, the, the Partizan or the Cibona uh, Olympia, Crvena Zvezda, Zadar, uh, uh, all the good teams, but every every one of these cities we would go, we actually had our fans as well, and and people appreciated and respected the way we played basketball, and and we were somewhat Yugoslavian team or even European team because th- to these days. Now, I have a fans from, for, from uh, Maccabi Tel Aviv or Barcelona telling us as much as we loved our teams, we, got, we had so much respect for you guys because we appreciated the, the way you guys played basketball. And, and, and that, that, that stays with me as, as really uh, kind of they taking the hats off to us for, for, for the, the style and then we played the game. Do you see parallels to your years in Chicago then maybe? I think where it was also a highly respected team. Obviously. Yes, abso- absolutely. I, I agree because going to the, to the NBA from this kind of environment, you're hoping that that can happen and repeats itself. But, but on the back of my mind, I go like I'm going with the new guys. I, I don't know none of these guys. I, I didn't grew up with the practicing playing with these guys so I, I I didn't expect it to be this good as it was with with Igor Plastica but then with, with Michael coming back and all that I, I now I see how lucky I was to have that kind of extended career first with Igor Plastica but the, but then with the with the Bulls Igor Plastica being a, a, a European team and the Bulls obviously being American maybe even The, the world team at the yeah. at, at the time. I I I do love the fact that that you got to be lucky to to achieve that that kind of extended maybe 12 years or or, or so. Uh, in, in my career, that was I was lucky enough to have these awesome teammates, the the, the awesome coaches, and and kind of put the mark of my career. Yeah, definitely. That's an amazing career. And um, it's because you also mentioned it, there's actually a question I had lined up for later, but um, it fits actually quite well here. I personally was lucky enough to see basketball on top European level. And also uh, I went to some some uh, NBA playoff or even final games. I think a lot of people over here in Europe don't have the chance to witness both. And I think there's a very distinct gap between the European fa- fan culture when it comes to basketball and the NBA fan culture. And also I think the atmospheres that you have in the European stadiums or the, the arenas in the NBA. Um, could you maybe explain a little bit uh, to the viewers how the difference of, of playing in a rough Euro- European environment versus playing in a rough NBA environment? <laughs> very much different. There are places. There are places in Europe where you fear for your head. Exactly. That's what I was aiming at. I was. There are places. There are places, there are places really that that you feel. I mean, it's all in your head. Uh, but but there are there are players that get really very much affected by by playing on the road in certain places, like uh, in um, in Thessaloniki, in Greece, in, in general, in Greece. Um, and then, like in Zadar, Chachak, uh, Shibanik, in a small, uh, small gym where, when you are taking the ball out of bounds, they are really, you know, grabbing you, spitting on you, and the stuff in, in, in NBA arenas are you know, impossible, inimaginable to do. I yeah, we oh. actually, I, I, I recall if you, if you remember, Dino, we played. I think it was in Greece when a bottle of red wine splashed the floor 
it was like five minutes before the end of the game. We were up by 17 or something, and, and a bottle of red wine hit the floor. I remember, actually, I, I played for Benetton, but we played in Rome, and, and I got hit by the coin. In the middle of the fast break, I got hit by the coin right in the middle of my eye. Next thing I know, I'm in a hospital. They're checking my eye. Uh, that, that, there's impossible for that to okay. happen in, me, in the NBA. Let me tell you a story. Let me tell you a true story. Like, like in Greece, Greeks are crazy completely. Oh, yeah, so you I, play play. For, I, I play in Greece for three years. And uh, we play against the Ike team. And we play in the same gym. But the fans are, you know, opposite fans. We are playing on the road. And uh, when you enter the arena, they go nuts. And it was full arena, 17,000 people. Not a word. We'd, we go through the warm up, not a word. And we players are like talking in between us, like, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening today? Are they protesting something against their own team? Are they. What's going on? And we didn't know. And, and you know, it's uh, Greeks, you don't understand uh, mostly what, what they are speaking. So we have introduction. And now you have three minutes. And then uh, one minute before uh, the, the game, referee blows the, the, the whistle and you have the last meeting. So on the one minute mark, we had around, I don't know, two, three hundred eggs, fresh eggs, flying from <laughs> everywhere to us. And it took like an hour of, of the game stop, stoppage to clean the freaking eggs from the court. And everybody was hit, everybody. In the head, in the shoulders, in the back, in the feet, everybody, because it was flying from everywhere. It was unbelievable. <laughs> This is so interesting because, um, you know, the press, if you talk about the stereotypes, I think back in, in, in your guys' days, it was even more than it is today, but of the European coming to the NBA, oh, does he have the mindset? Is he strong physically or mentally strong enough to play in the league? All this blah, blah, blah. And then I'm thinking like, hey, guys, like uh, Dino had like uh, 200 fresh eggs thrown at him and the worst thing you had to encounter was Spike Lee on the sideline. So how like how can that be that, that the perception is always that uh, they're not the Europeans coming in are not mentally tough enough to play in the NBA. I had I had Byron Scott, you know, the guy who, who won the titles with the Lakers with the Magic. He played with me one year in uh, in Greece, and he left the game at the ha halftime. And he said, "These guys are crazy. I have uh, three kids and a wife at home. I, I don't." Exactly. And he left the game. He didn't. He, he didn't want to play. I remember the first time, the, one of the first time we, we played in Chachak. I think it was in Chachak. They warned us about the umbrella, and, and we, we were guessing what, what the umbrella is. And actually, right in the middle of the court, there was this old man that would sit right on, a, on the sidelines, and he would try to hook a people players with umbrella with the, the, uh, if, if we were running, if we were running on, a, on the side just to help his team. Or I remember we played other plays that they would purposely leave a door open so one side of the arena would freeze. And, and it, it, was, it was so much difference in, in, in playing on one side of the court that was on the other side of the court. And they would try to put, freeze your bench. So no, anybody coming off the bench would just be frozen and not able to run or jump or do anything. Uh, the, so all kinds of tricks back, back then were used to, to help their Remember teams. Remember when they cut off the heating from our bus? <laughs> the yes, game, yes, I, I do. I mean, all kinds, of, all kinds of stuff. There, there were there were times uh, uh, in our league that the, 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 we were losing the games or something like that. Somebody would just turn the lights in the arena, and it would be like a stoppage about thirty minutes. The people wouldn't know what's going on, what's happening, and then we come back. The, the, basically, the game begins. Uh, again, that, that 15, 20 point advantage that the team had meant nothing at that point because they were scared what's going to happen. Are they going to actually get out of the place alive? And then we just used it in our advantage and won a game. So it was always these kind of tricks back then. And, and when you come to the United States, the, the, yes, there are more people, but 
you, you're not going to get scared of somebody yelling uh, defense, defense, or clock going faster and slower depends on the, of the score. <laughs> oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That too. I mean, it would be like, Uh, it would be like three minutes, 58, 59. They would go like three minutes, zero, one. And instead of 259, it would be one, 159. So they would skip the whole minute uh, on, a, on a scoreboard if, if the, the team was winning. I mean, all kinds of stuff, but that was back then. And, and <laughs> now... <laughs> If that stuff happened to, to, to NBA, it would be considered as a terrorist attack. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, but it's, it, was, it was a whole... That, that's, that's a true home court advantage. It's a beauty. What, so what so you, you, had to what fight, you had to fight for a home court advantage, and once you had a home court advantage, then uh, you really had to use it. Never want to give it away. But, but th those are the fun, good old, good old days that... that Everybody was using, everybody appreciates right now, but... Uh, so what's scarier, what was, what's scarier, having to play overtime in Panathinaikos or two days in Vegas with Rodman? <laughs> uh, uh, there, there's no question. Um, uh, I, I would say that the two days with Dennis are interesting. Okay. They're, they're fun, they're a lot of fun, but, but if you're not experienced with that, if you're not used to all the stuff, he, he, he wears you out. <laughs> playing, playing, and playing over there, you're really not sure if you're going to get your head alive out of the locker if you win. And, and we had actually cases when we would stay in the locker room for like 45 minutes, an hour, before we're sure that we can make it from the locker room to the bus and be escorted to the uh, uh, airport without people trying to break the, the glass of the, uh, on the bus and then they, they were throwing rocks and stuff. But at the time, it was a, it was a part of the atmosphere. Cool. Speaking of the good old days, like you mentioned, Tony, not only were you guys on the same championship teams, but you actually grew up in the same city. Can you tell us about your first memories of the first time you guys actually met on the basketball court? <laughs> He was this sick when he came first time. <laughs> I, I, I literally, they, they were like opposites, opposites. I, I was always uh, like alive, always outside. I was like chasing lizards, uh, uh, the, uh, always playing soccer, doing all kinds of stuff. So, so my dad, actually my dad and one of the coaches, my, our first coach uh, said like, okay, You're tall, you, 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 you're kind of athletic. Why don't you come and play basketball? And on the other side, you, Dina, tell your story. <laughs> uh, the same thing. I, I grew up uh, during one summer a lot, and my mother told me, listen, you grew up a lot, why don't you try basketball? Because you, when you're a kid, you know, you try to do any kind of sport. And uh, after one summer that I grew up, my mother told me, why don't you try? And... Um, I, I was a very shy guy and I didn't want to go over there alone because I didn't know anybody. So she made one friend of mine to go with me and that guy went with me first time, last time and never again. <laughs> but, but I found, you know, I found some good company over there and uh, uh, some good kids and I, they asked me, are you going to come tomorrow? Are you going to come tomorrow? And I started coming and Tony lived like 25 meters from the arena, so it was yes, I, I, I literally, I li I'm literally a hundred yards, a hundred yards uh, from the arena. My dad used to take me to some of the basketball games, but at the time, my dad was a soccer player. He would encourage me to be a soccer player. So at the time, I played soccer, and and when the coach saw me on a uh, at, uh, at the beach. He goes, like, you, you got to play basketball. And I said, yeah, but I'm playing soccer. He goes, like, forget about it. That's not for you. You're tall. You might be good playing basketball. Please come um, in, in, a, in a week. Come and, and try basketball. And I actually did. I, I think that that was the best idea ever. Sounds, sounds like sounds it was like a pretty good idea. This also brings me to uh, one, one question I had lined up for you guys. Something that I've really, as a big sports fan, not only basketball in general, what I've always asked myself, um, if you look at the former uh, Yugoslavia, 
you guys had a, a 23 million population, if I research correctly. I think Croatia has roughly 4 million. And yet uh, that's the size of Florida or that's the size of probably a suburb in China. Um, but yet in, in this small country, you have such an enormous... Um, population of, of incredible athletes. And that's not only basketball, but you have a world-class football team. You have really good water polo, handball, uh, Djokovic playing tennis, uh, even skiing. I mean, the, the list just goes on and on and on. So I've like really always, when I watch the, the Olympics or just follow sports in general, and I, I, I see like huge countries, not without being dis disrespectful, but like India that has like, I don't know, how many uh, billion in population and then somehow Croatia is always in every sport or uh, Yugoslavia back then uh, on the on the top list um, is that something that really uh, the sports culture is it something that you guys get fed as kids that makes you to such a, a crazy athletic nation or is it just a sign of somewhat uh, inherited in 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 the culture I think it's in the water but that's all I'm going to tell you I can't tell you which water but it's in the water. <laughs> it is the biggest secret ever. <laughs> now I'm joking. I, I don't. I don't. I don't know what it is, but it is a true statement. And and I love the fact that, that there's a lot of the talented people in uh, all kinds of sports coming from that region. Maybe it's because we were never staying home, playing with the uh, uh, video games, watching TVs, computers, and this and that. Uh, we always would go out. Either you'd be in a school or you would go outside and, and play whatever was on, 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 a, on a schedule that, 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 that summer or that winter. It would be the, the soccer, the soccer, football, uh, uh, world championship or basketball championship or, or any kinds of stuff that kids would right after the game go outside and play and play all day and all night. And, and I think just, just that part kind of got everybody interested in sports. And then once you, once you start to go to the organized uh, practices and, and events, you, you, you find the similar guys to you that, that, are, that are interested to learn the game, to, to, to um, kind of reach some kind of level of, of, of being excellent in, in, in that game, being like perfectionist, like, like Dino was, I was, Drajan was, or let's say uh, Goran Ivanishevich in tennis, or Djokovic, let's say, in tennis, or uh, Janica in, in the, as, a, as a skier. Um, not to say other sports, you mentioned um, uh, handball, water polo, and I don't know. It's just it's just that way, and once you start growing in that in that uh, direction, you don't want to stop. You you, you want to see where your limit is, and and all of us for some reason try to to reach as as high as we could. I'm definitely buying stock on uh, water from Split after yeah. this. Uh, <laughs> Do you know anything you want to add to that? I think. Uh... Uh, it's it's hard to say, you know, but I think it's a combination of uh, sport culture in, in, in this area plus, uh, you know, some genetics that we are, you know, uh, taller than, than, than uh, like Italians or uh, some other people. And then, you know, people from South, they have this crazy mentality that... Uh, um, <laughs> you're making us crazy. <laughs> wants to be the best. We want to be the best. Always want to be the best. And um, as you know, many times uh, I even I ask myself, why am I like that? And I guess it's something that you get by your genes. And uh, uh, why you want to be the best? Why you want to work hard? Uh, but definitely, you know, the sport uh, culture, not only basketball, you know, all all kind of sports. Is uh, is on very high level, and uh, the the old type coaches uh, make make us work really hard. I mean, uh, there were times when we practiced ten hours a day, and uh, when you hear ten hours a day, you think it's a lot, but not that much. But it is really it was that much. You know, sometimes we come to work out seven in the morning till noon, and then from five until ten. You don't run sprints for 10 hours, but you do things 
And, and uh, you know, you, you do a number of repetitions. And I always like to say that, that the model of success is a number of repetitions. And we used to do a lot of them, <laughs> a lot, believe me. Yeah, well, I'm still always fascinated by this small country uh, being so athletic dominant. For me, as per population, it's probably the most athletic dominant country in the world. Um, Chris, you wanted to uh, touch on, on the next question? Yeah, I had one thing that I was interested in your guys' take on. Um, because you obviously helped pave the way as European players who became significant contributors for your NBA franchise. And I was interested in, in hearing your take on the perception that modern guys, like let's say Luka Doncic, for example, that they are confronted with. Are they, in your opinion, dealing with less stereotypes and with a different perception as European players coming to the NBA now? Let me tell you one thing. When, when we came to NBA, they were giving us bags to carry, the, the, the practice gear and stuff. When Luka Doncic came to NBA, they gave him the city of, the, of, of Dallas. So uh, I'm proud to be part of that generation that was a pioneer in, um, of European players, of out of NBA, of American players in NBA. And I think that we did that everybody uh, a huge favor, showing everybody that, um, that uh, we can play. And uh, after it was much easier to somebody to get, you know, some credit to start with because when we start we didn't get any credit zero you had to start from the bench you had to start doing some dirty stuff and both of us went through a lot of i don't want to say bad world but you know what i mean until we get some credit you know uh, for being a good players it's it's hard when you when you achieve so much in europe then you get to the nba and then they basically tell you Uh, we're not sure you can play this game. Um, your physique is not good. Your defense is not good. Your rebounding is not good. We don't know if you can shoot, if you can do anything. So, yeah, for now, carry the bags from the bus to the, uh, to the airplane. Uh, uh, bring the uh, starters, uh, uh, the, the drinks and food, uh, uh, the tie their shoes, uh, uh, the, the, like put the laces in the shoes and stuff like that. And you're going like, do I really need this in my life? Is, is this really necessary for me to do? But, uh, and plus, when, when we got over, over to the NBA, I don't think many coaches and many players have ever seen us play. Very few. And, and, and now, Doncic, uh, when Doncic came over there, there, there are so you can go on YouTube and see pretty much every one of his games. Or Instagram, the, the so the Instagram, anywhere you want to go. So, so you basically know Doncic and his game up and down. And when we, when we came here, I don't think Phil Jackson ever saw me play. Or for that matter, most of my teammates, Michael and, and Scotty, saw me play in the Olympics. And, and that was their, their view of, of, of me where I had one terrible game and one decent game. But that was all they saw from me. So us going over there, when I came to the NBA, um, they were trying to switch me from the small forward point forward to, to play a four spot because they were in need of a, of a four spot. And, and so we, we needed a good, uh, I'll say, one and a half, two years of, of adjustment to our game, what we played home, to what we what they were asking from us to play in the NBA. Uh, do you think also European basketball and NBA basketball also because of the um, more and more dominant NBA, European NBA players has become more alike so that someone like, let's say, Yanis or a Luka Doncic or a Nikola Jokic can adapt earlier or do they still have to go through the same phases of adaption between like the Euro game they, they learned and the, the NBA game? Well, I, I, I think, the Dino, if you want to say, go, go ahead. I'll wait for you. I think it has changed. Uh, they have so much credit in, in, to start with. I mean, they're all good players. It's, uh, there is no doubt about that. But uh, it's, it's, it's much easier for them than, than, than it was for us. Uh, for example, if uh, we do a mistake, uh, you go on the bench. If they do a mistake, they don't go on the bench. Um, 
So it's it's easier. But I, I, I'm telling you, I'm very proud to be part of this uh, pioneer batch of people coming to uh, coming to NBA and, uh, and and showing everybody that we are talented and we can play and we can adjust. On the level of uh, of competition, of uh, number of games, of different minutes, and uh, after that, uh, maybe some people who would never uh, even think about coming, uh, they say, "Oh, look at them! Maybe I can do it too." So slowly, I think we paved the way for everybody, and um, I'm really, you know, proud to be part of that of that generation that uh, that was, uh, you know, basically the uh, Bormio '87 generation that uh, that made everything uh, you know happen. You know the the er- earthquake of uh, of world basketball uh, was uh, was uh, uh, that team was uh, like a heart of of, uh, of uh, earthquake of uh, you yeah. know, changes in uh, in world basketball. Well, I, I absolutely, I absolutely agree on that. When when we first got to the NBA, it was a question mark if we can play in the NBA at all. There, there was there, there wasn't any any question if any of us uh, can can uh, play the All Star game. There, there was like a zero chance for us to play an All Star game at, at at that time. And then slowly but surely, uh, the the more and more people came over. Um, like, like Tony Parker, Novitski, um, the, the other, other players right now, the, the Doncic or, or, or Giannis, people understand that, that they're good enough to carry the team, to be a main guy uh, in, in a team. So, so now instead of us uh, needing to adjust to a team, they're going to give them the open chance, the open hand and the trust uh, that their, their their basketball game is not good enough, but they can carry the team, and they try to adjust everybody else around them. So 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 now Doncic comes the first, okay, maybe second year, and he's a guy that holds the ball more than anybody else in the team, and he's the one that that directs other players, which couldn't be the case back uh, back then. Giannis now is the uh, is the key to success. In uh, in Milwaukee, and as he goes, the, the the Milwaukee team goes. So it's the same case with uh, okay. uh, with Doncic. So yeah. it is true that that we were the pioneers for the for the transition of the European players to NBA. So 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 NBA uh, people have some trust in in how good of a players we are and how good we can be. You guys, uh, every. Buddy that follow basketball or back in the days knows that the 90s is known as the hard knock era of the of the NBA. Uh, you had hand checking and you had uh, crazy teams like the Detroit Pistons that used to close line people and stuff. So, uh, I'm speaking because you guys are definitely both men of peace. But let's just say it's 2 a.m. in the morning and you're coming out of a, a pub in uh, or a bar in in Boston or Chicago. Uh, who's your your guys' dark alley team if some punks are trying to jump you after that? So. Who, who would the, be the three guys from the era you played with or against uh, that would be your running mates uh, after after the bar? Me, Rick Mahorn, Xavier McDaniel, and Ivica Duka. Okay, that was fast. It was really fast. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Ivica Duka, Ivica Duka is our favorite. Daniels. Sorry, Ivica Duka, it's our both favorite because he used to do that for us when we first started playing. So we were kids. 17, 18 year old, and he was our teammate. He's actually well known as the as the international scout for the Bulls. Mm-hmm. Uh, still, he's, he's still the, working for the Bulls. Good, good, almost 30 years. And and but at that time, he was the one when when team couldn't beat us. They, they would send their bad players, and they would try to beat Dino and me as the kids. And he would be the enforcer. That would that would beat them back. And say like, if you again touch these kids, I'm coming to your house, and I'm gonna beat you in front of your wife too. <laughs> so, so that's why we would we're gonna take him the, as as number one. But but the, the I would everybody says that Charles Oakley was one of the the, the biggest enforcers in uh in in the NBA. I know that from from Scottie Pippen. I know that from Michael because they always wanted to have him. 
I played against him and I know how bad he can hurt people. So, but, but it, 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 he, I, I would, I would take Dennis because Dennis in, in, in his, in his mind was always ready to start some kind of fight, some kind of crazy stuff and all that. And obviously the, the Michael and Scotty were, were, were ready for, for, for that as well. But every, every, at that era, every team had their own, and for us, own, uh, guys, you, you can go from Indiana to, to, I call them Davis brothers. Yeah, the Davis uh, brothers, or, amazing. Or, 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 you, or New York or uh, uh, Miami for the Alonzo Morning and then PJ Brown. Uh, Utah obviously had Carl Malone. Uh, um, so, so every team more or less needed to have, at that era, needed to have, not to mention Detroit Pistons. It was just that kind of the era that that teams were were uh, forced to have two or three guys ready to fight at all time. Right now, uh, all the good players, all the talented players, are actually way more protected by the league and and, and by the referees. So there's no way something something like that will fly in in today's basketball. Although I did think maybe in the in the bubble, it, it got a little rowdier than uh, than I was used to watching, uh, especially also for for Luca. I think um, he had to take a, a couple couple hits at the end of the day. Probably nothing like uh, like you guys had to go through. But believe me, if they play in that era, it would be much different. <laughs> much different. That era was brutal. I always think maybe that uh, I don't know if you guys see it the same way. It could be on an international level, uh, speaking of the 92 Olympics, that um, the basketball world was maybe robbed of, as I would call it, the greatest game ever to be played. I think you guys know what I'm aiming at. Um, I, I think I would have so loved to see the, the former Yugoslavia team uh, lace up against the dream team. And I, I just, now that I have the chance to ask you guys in person, would this have shocked the world, this game? Um, or let's say you guys, if you would have had Vladi and, and Co at your side, uh, in, in uh, which what most probably would have been the finals, um, what would be your take on, on, on this game that unfortunately never was played? Well, I'll tell you this. Uh, if, if that team um, had experience of the NBA, Like we gained later, later on, obviously, me with the Bulls, Dino with Boston, uh, uh, Lay Drajan and Vladi and all the other guys. And, and we did not have maybe that much respect to the NBA players. I think it would have been the greatest game, basketball game ever played. Agree. Because uh, my opinion is as, as physical as they were, as, as uh, athletically, let's say, dominant, we had way more time spent together and, and knew each other to the, to the T. So I think that would play in our advantage. And in a one game like that, um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, that we had no chance to win a game like that. But it need, we needed to have that experience in, in playing in the NBA. Because we would just approach that game differently than, than we did back then. Okay. Very, well, very I, I agree with everything he said. I mean, it, it's a lot of ifs that uh, we will never know. But, uh, you know, as, um, as a player, as, uh, you know, kind of players that we were, each of us thinks that he's the best and that he can compete with the best. So uh, none of us would ever come to the game thinking, uh, okay, we quit. We are losing for sure. And um, what Tony said, the experience uh, of like one season at least uh, in NBA would, would give us the edge to play, I think, you know, on one possession game. Well, I always say if I had a couple of wishes free in my life, I would love to see Bob Marley live, which I never did. It's not late. We all live. Most of us. And I really want to see this game, uh, uh, former Yugoslavia versus uh, the Dream Team. I think it would have been one definitely for the history books and the ages. Um, guys, I'm going to take one, uh, just a qu quickly a different topic because what we do here obviously at BSN every day is uh, we're a retail store that caters to a, a, let's say, very educated fashion and sportswear customer. 
And um, also something I've always been interested in, or at least in my general perception is, it's obvious that, that let's say, swag and style play uh, a huge part in the American basketball culture. I think the States all the way uh, back to the, to the 70s, where you had guys like Dr. J with the Afro or, or Slick Watts, who already um, uh, wore his headband slightly crooked just to kind of give that extra element of expression on the game. How was it for you guys back in Yugo Plastica? Was style, encore, fashion really anything you ever thought about? Or was it more like, hey, guys, give us a pair of high tops, maybe even the coaches' high tops and some socks and let's roll out and play? Or were there certain other players from Europe that you look up to in terms of style? Or was it just like really whatever, let's go? No, man, we just love the game. We love the game. The, the, the base of everything is our love for the game. We would come hour before the practice, staying after the practice to play, you know, two and two, three and three, one on one, every day. I mean, we had our coach, you know, putting veto on, our, on, on us playing one on one before the practice because we would kill each other and be so tired that, that we, we wouldn't do practice well. We love the game, man. We love the game. That, that's, that's the key of everything. Tony? No, uh, our arena, our arena, the, 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 the one at, at Gripa that we first started, not the big one that we played later on, the Europe, Euro League. Uh, our arena could fit, what, 3,000 people, maybe 4,000 people at the, at the most of the time. So we, as Dino says, we would, we would be there eight, nine hours a day. So uh, as soon as you come into arena, we would try to shoot the ball literally from everywhere. We would go up to the stands and shoot the ball from the stands, from the half court, from as, as soon as you as, as you enter through the door, uh, from the corners, from the bathrooms. Uh, it, it was just the way how to how to score, how to like it wasn't just the court. It, it was the whole arena was a place of practice. And and uh, that, that was that was fascinating when I when I tell guys that we that we actually did practice and 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 our coaches insisted on knowing and and doing the fundamentals of the game over and over and over it wasn't important if you were uh 180 or or 210 in in the meters which would be five feet or seven eight feet whatever they wanted you to know how to dribble know how to pass know how to shoot Every single detail of, of basketball, they knew that uh, they wanted everybody to know and understand. And when you have uh, five players like that on the court, it's way easier to, to play the game, to, to uh, move the players around. The, and, and that's the one thing I, I always think the European basketball is, is, was better than, than NBA. Just from a standpoint, in, in NBA, you have one, maybe two guys like that in a team And everybody else is so-called specialist, where he is a, either just a shooter or just a rebounder or just a defender. Uh, in, in, in European basketball, you, you have 10 guys in a team that practices the same way, knows every position, uh, knows how to adjust themselves. The, the, the little the shorter guys can play one, two, three, maybe four. The, the taller guys can play uh three four five at the time so it's way easier to to find the system and adjust the players to the system then that then come and play and and, and call every position because you have a standard point guard you have the standard small forward the standard four standard fives and and that's where the game is actually going even now yeah so do you feel like the the nba in a way has gotten a little bit more European recently in terms of more positionless basketball, switch everything that kind of way? No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, it's uh, just NBA. I think that's a global basketball right now. Everybody plays with the, with the, with the five guys, almost a similar size, the, the, the guys that can uh, uh, switch every play, the guys that, that most of them can, can run as a point guard and, and run the team, run the system. Um, uh, the th teams can play zone because there's actually not not big of a difference who's who's front who's back since the, the, they're all similar size. So I think the whole game it, it's going that way. It, it's basically 
got kind of turning into a street basketball. I think that's super interesting because if you if you take a look at the shoe that we designed, um, that was also really my inspiration was like the purity and the essence of the game that that the European culture and I think back then even more broader. That's why if you look at the shoe, it has like we tried to choose materials that are had kind of like that that vintage OG, OG touch. Uh, the the tongue is slightly yellowish. Uh, the sole is slightly yellowish. We use gum rubber on the sole simply because gum rubber has the best traction. We didn't want to put any flashy elements uh, on it. it. It was supposed to like really represent the purity of the, the Yugo Plastic of basketball. And I think that's what we did a pretty good job on and, and why that related back uh, the, to the community so well. Yeah, you guys did a great job. And we honored the, 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 about that stuff. The shoe, the shoe is awesome. And, and you're absolutely right. It represents the, the, the team, the old days, the understanding of the uh, of the game right now, uh, and I don't know if that's good or not. In, in our days, you would actually have to break into a shoe in order to wear a shoe. And right now, the, the people maybe use a shoe for five practices and one game, and they throw that pair and they play in the next pair. So I don't I, I don't want to say which way is right or not. Uh, in our times, we absolutely had a uh, a respect and love for that shoe. Well, it was like the, like the gr like the greatest thing. It was like a totem of 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 love appreciation for basketball to have the shoe. And that's what we tried to capture. So for you guys firsthand to understand what we did there is, is uh, makes this project uh, even cooler. Should we bring it to the to the speed round, I guys? Think so. Uh, I think we're, we're um, approaching kind of the, the end, at least from our side. Uh, we prepared like a small speed round, meaning it's a question, a couple of questions that you have a short amount of time to think about and then more like a rapid fire answer uh, thing. So um, if you're ready, I'd, I'd just start off with, with you, Tony. And okay. uh, the first question I have is uh, best European player never to play in the NBA. Oh, my God. Uh, Yuri Zdovt. Okay. Or Body Roga for that matter. I had Body Roga, that's why yeah. uh, that, that was kind of... Well, I'm going back to my times. Because I thought, I, I thought Yuri was a, a, a special point guard. And, and he was very, very important for us. Not many people mention him from that team. Because everybody goes with Drajan, with Dino, with Vlade, with myself. But, but I, I think he was very, very, very important piece of, of, of that team and that generation. And obviously, um, the Bodiroga is well known, one of the best European players of all time. So, let's say, let's say two of them. Not, not to disrespect. I don't know. You, 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 you can't yes, many, you uh, could go wrong like, if you don't say Gallis. Or, not good, I was or, just about to say Nikos Gallis. Uh, there's, there's, yeah, uh, yeah. I, I, many, that's, like, that's exactly why I said that these are not good fast rounds because you cannot disrespect and forget about so many good European players. It, it's I, only, and it's, I'm going to always go back first to my times guys, yeah. then, then look before and after. It's, it's the only question like that, so you're, you're free from now on. Dino, you want to add to that? I think uh, I, I agree with Tony. Uh, Jura was the glue that put us all together. He was really a special guy. I, I really, uh, he's, he's one of my, my, my top uh, point guards that I ever, ever played with. So, Dino, question for you, maybe easier uh, to answer. Uh, Schlievowitz or Jack Daniels? <laughs> none, none of them. None of them? I don't like I, 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 If I have to choose. <laughs> if you have to. If I have to choose Jack Daniels, I use Schlievowitz for the, uh, uh, when, when the water cooler freezes. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Dino, bird or magic? Bird, of course. I, I think yeah. any other any other answer, you would never be allowed uh, to come back. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I really, I really think Larry was a special player. Magic was too, but Larry was a special player. I met him. I practiced with him sometimes. So, building on that, Tony, uh, you know what's coming now: uh, MJ or LeBron? <laughs> uh, who's the second one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's i mean the, you you can always argue argue both sides but but um because they they basically never played in the same era but but when it when it comes to uh uh a, a pure basketball and what 
people did for a game of basketball, I, I, I believe that, that Michael Jordan is, is, is number one. Uh, you can compare uh, that kind of, of uh, moving a needle in, in certain sports is like with Tiger and golf, probably Ronaldo and Messi uh, in, in, in soccer, uh, Phelps in, in swimming. So th those are those kind of people that, that yes, the, the, the LeBron might be a better athlete, But when it comes to, to doing so much more for, for game of basketball, um, and, and plus his, his winning mentality, his, his desire to, to, to win, to be the best, to, to sacrifice uh, his life and, and, and his body to, to win and, and get mad at everybody in the team to achieve these goals was, was just special. Not everybody appreciated and couldn't handle it, but, but at the end, when you win championships and, and you win three, some lucky guys, six of them, then, then respect needs to be given. You don't have to convince us. We're, we're <laughs> a generation, MJ. Uh, I think what I really, uh, I respect the, the hell out of LeBron, of, of course, I think like everybody on, on the call. And what I is, is respect immensely is the way he takes care of his body and everything he does like on the scientific way. I, I think uh, Michael was, 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 would play a couple rounds of golf while LeBron would go into his hydro chamber. So that is something I think that is respectable. But yeah, definitely in our generation, it's, it's team, team MJ, uh, ride or die. Uh, Dino, this one is uh, for us as a, a Germans, obviously also a, a touchy one. Uh, Dirk or Duncan? Uh, difficult one. I think Tim was slightly, slightly better player, but uh, Dirk Nowitzki was, you know, huge, huge also. Definitely one of the best, um, but it's a uh, very, very, um, you know, and gratifying, uh, you know, answer to either un unfair to either of them, maybe, you know, 51, 49. Tony, you want to add on that? You guys have hard questions. Yes, this one <laughs> is that hard. wasn't a no. question for me, Dino, answer that question. I mean, you're talking about uh, probably top five of the four spots that, that ever played the game. So, so how you can go wrong with either one? One was yeah, a probably a the, the, one, have to. <laughs> one is a probably better outside shooter, has more outside game, but but Duncan was so fundamentally good and sound underneath the basketball, uh, uh, 15 feet from the, 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 the from the baseline. Um, he won how many championships? Let's let's go that let's go that way. The one that wins uh, more championships is 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 a little better than the, than the other one. But but absolutely, I have nothing but great respect for for everything everything that that Dirk uh, did for for European basketball for basketball in general. Um, he brought the only I think yes the, the only championship in Dallas. I don't want to say it by himself, but but he was a huge, huge part of, uh, of, kind of, of that. <laughs> it was, uh, I think it must be arguably one of the greatest one one man performances in the history of NBA Finals. I, I, I would I would probably say, but I mean it's hard. It's we didn't uh, we chose the questions to not make them easy. Obviously, for us as a German company, it's easier to answer that question. But uh, obviously, Timmy Duncan also, yeah, one of my all time favorites. Uh, Tony, maybe an easier question for you to to end the speed round. Um, uh, red wine as a pregame meal? Yes or no? Red wine as a pregame meal rather than what? A Diet Coke uh, or something else? Red wine, 100%. <laughs> okay. No, we just because we uh, uh, obviously we came across one of those uh, famous interviews with Steve Kerr uh, about your pregame meal preparations. So we thought this might be. Uh, I'll tell you that. I, I, I mean, if if we if we're not running out of time, I'll tell you that little story. What it's all about. Expect. So it was our. It was literally our first game. My first game here in the NBA was a preseason. We're playing somewhere, somewhere in Indiana. So, so Steve goes like, do you do want to have a, a meal around three o'clock before we go to the game? And we're going like, yeah, might as well. 
So I go down first in a restaurant. I sit down. I check the menu before the, the Steve and the other guys come down. And I see every meal like a soup is $2. The, the salad is $2. A pasta is like $3. A, a piece of chicken is like the, the, the $3.95. And I'm going like, this is all in, in $10. I'm going to be starving. So before they come down, I order all this. By the time they come down, there's a family portion of pasta, family portion of soup, family portion of, of, of salad. And of course, I order a glass of red wine, which to us was a normal thing. It's not that I'm going to drink a bottle of red wine, but I don't think the, the, the glass of red wine will hurt you. Actually, when we played in Italy, Dino, I don't know if you guys were accustomed to that or not. When we played in Italy, everybody would have a team lunch, a team dinner, but uh, the, but uh, one or two bottles of red wine would always be on the table. So so if the guys would choose to drink a glass of uh, wine instead of uh, uh, Coke or Sprite or or Orangina, whatever it was, it was it was optional. And and so by the time Steve comes down. He looks at me and he goes like, are you out of your mind? Are you going to do that? So me to being funny, I'm going like, well, this is what we do in Europe. We eat a lot. We drink a little bit. We get a shot of double espresso. We go to room. We do what we need to do. And we're ready to go to play. Legendary. <laughs> and that, and that's how he brought that story out. Awesome. Um, do you know one thing I wanted to ask you, uh, maybe final, is this, uh, we were researching Do you actually have, is there a nickname that you have, that uh, Encore nickname? Me, Encore? I don't remember. What, what did you hear? We couldn't no, we be, I mean, obviously, anything. Tony, uh, the, the spider of Split is, I think, one of the most iconic. Uh, I never, I never, I had a, um, when I was a kid, I had a, as I had a huge foot. They, <clears throat> they, in my elementary school, they used to call me a Finn. And, uh, That, that was my nickname as a kid, but uh, when I was playing basketball, I, I don't remember. It was just Dino gets buckets. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. So once again, uh, thank you so much. This was really an honor for us as basketball fans. And, and uh, we really up, enjoyed it. Enjoyed it. Growing up, watching you guys, idolizing uh, that era of, the bas of basketball is like... Uh, Super cool. Thank you from the heart. Thank you guys for having us. That's all right. Guys. Thank, Thank you. Care. Take care, everyone. Stay Thanks. safe. Bye. Introducing the BSTN Forum 84 High and Low Basketball Legacy by Adidas. Not old school. Classic.